Recently, I made a trip to the north of Cornwall, specifically to see the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic in Boscastle. But while I was there, I was able to see so many amazing, magical and historical locations. We stopped in at the museum, which I did a full video on, I'll link it in the description box, but we also managed to see the believed birthplace of King Arthur at Tintagel, and the believed burial site of him, where there's a 6th century Oem stone. Along the way, we also saw historical buildings from the Tudor period all the way up to the Victorian, and we even made a stop at Glastonbury to see the amazing witchcraft shops and to experience some of that magical atmosphere. This trip was amazing, and hopefully in this vlog you'll experience even just a small fraction of that magic. So with that being said, let's get started on my birthday where we visited the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. <music> Officially my birthday, it is July 1st. It's my birthday, it's my birthday, it's my birthday. I'm very, very excited. My partner got me these gorgeous earrings. I'm absolutely obsessed with them. They're like little mushrooms. And today we are going to the Boss Castle Witchcraft Museum, which is somewhere I have never been before. I'm very excited. So yeah, I'm excited. And I already lost two fingernails. No, let's grab that. Three. I already lost three, so I need to repaint them on again because of all of the days in the year to have a full set of nails, it's got to be a birthday, right? And it's got to be. It was really lovely to get to see the town. We walked basically all the way through straight to the museum and I was so, so excited. You might have noticed through the intro clips, I was incredibly excited to go here and it was so incredibly worth it. When we got there, it was better than I could have ever imagined. It was really affordable to get in. And as we walked our way around, I saw things that I'd only ever seen in photos or in other people's videos or via the talks that I attend online. And I was finally getting to see these things in person, things that belonged to historical figures of the magical community, such as Alistair Crowley, even though I know most people dislike him, and also figures like Gerald Gardner and Doreen Valiente, and figures that I didn't think I'd ever have a chance to see the items to, I was standing just inches away from. It was amazing. I also got to see Old Horny and the Hair Lady, Mandrakes, Curses, and also the Wise Woman's Cottage, which is something I've always been interested in since I put purchased the book called The Wise Woman's Cottage by Stephen Patterson, and so it was amazing to actually get to see this place in person. If I could have, believe me, I would have spent far more time in there, but I did come away with some goodies, including some more books, but I will leave that in the other video, so if you do want to see that, feel free to click the link in the description box. When we left the museum, rather begrudgingly on my part, I did end up doing like an extra bit of a loop around, because I was so excited to see everything, and I felt like I'd missed stuff the first time around. We went and had some lunch and then we went to see the actual waterfront at the harbour. Now the only downside of the day we went was that it was incredibly windy. <laughs> And so it was almost a little bit hazardous to stand too close to the edge, so I only got a few probably rather shaky clips because I was so scared of losing my phone. One of my biggest fears when I'm filming this kind of content is that one day the wind is just gonna snatch my phone out of my hand and I will lose every photo and every video clip. And especially when I'd just been to the Witchcraft Museum, 
I didn't want to risk that. As we walked back up through the town again, we ended up going into a few different shops. There were actually quite a few witchy crystal shops in the area, and there was a shop called The Other World. Now this is something that we'd already walked past on the way in, it looked really interesting. I wasn't allowed to take any video clips inside, unfortunately, but it was really magical inside, so it could be worth a visit if it is something you're interested in. So that was day one, and it was just absolutely amazing, possibly the best birthday I have ever had, like an actual birthday day. It was so, so much fun and I want to say a massive thank you to everyone who sent me a birthday message. It really meant a lot to me and I wasn't expecting anyone to actually send me one, so thank you so much to everyone who took the time out of their day to do so. It really meant a lot to me. You can hear the bells from the church. It's just out there is the church and it's Sunday morning so all the parishioners are going in in their Sunday best and I'm just trying to not burst into flames and it's really cute actually I have never been this close to church bells when they go off it's really peaceful but I can imagine it's really annoying if you want to lie in on a Sunday morning it is not happening here on the second day we ended up going to Lan Hydrock, which is a national trust house now, many of you maybe don't know this about me, but I absolutely love history, and I especially love architecture and anything even remotely old. So when I have the chance to go and see an old house in pretty gardens in the middle of the countryside, you know I'm going to take it. Lanhydrock is really interesting, not necessarily for its creation, but its near destruction. In 1881, there was a massive fire that nearly destroyed this Jacobean house, and it actually caused the death of the lady of the house. After the fire, the house was rebuilt in a Victorian style, and it contained the quintessential upstairs-downstairs style that was really popular during this time period. It was an absolutely beautiful house, and we got to learn a lot about the people who lived there and the history of the property. We got to see the beautiful architecture and the wallpaper. I could have had in my own house. I mean, it would look a bit strange in such a small space, but it was really, really nice. My favourite portion of the house, however, was the original Jacobean section, especially this grand room which contained mass amounts of books. It had the most amazing, unusual, oddity-style collection in it, but it was really the ceiling that's amazing. It plays out different scenes from the Bible, and there's actually information sheets dotted around that helps you identify which sections of the ceiling are associated with different stories, such as Adam and Eve and the Great Flood. While I'm not Christian in any way, I do find the stories to be really fascinating, and this place has a lot of history. It's really interesting for me to see how some people lived throughout history, and while this house definitely isn't the story of most people who lived in the UK, it is a story of a small percentage of them, the people who had the most, and so I do find it really interesting to see how the other half lived. Sadly, this house is also filled with a lot of sadness. Not only did the lady of the house sadly pass after the original fire in 1881, but the heirs to the house actually died during the Second World War, and the remaining women in the family couldn't take on the estate themselves because that was something only the men could do. And after the Second World War, there were so few men in the country that most of them didn't marry. This was really commonplace for the time period. Essentially, every eligible man was sent to war, and so potential husbands and husbands, as well as sons and brothers and fathers, they were all lost. And so while it is a beautiful house, it also does carry a lot of sadness with it as well. Once we'd seen the inside of the house, we had some lunch, and then we started to go around the gardens. We were lucky that today was actually really good weather, that isn't something we had for the rest of the week, however, we'll get onto that soon. But while we were here, the weather was really lovely, and we were able to walk around all of the gardens to see the church, as well as this small cottage that's in the grounds. Now, this cottage was lived in till around 100, 150 years ago, and it's believed that it actually became the National Trust's first tea room. And while it isn't a tea room anymore, it's really interesting to see that history. On the site, there's also a small well, and generally, it is beautiful. You have the most amazing views. The garden are filled with amazing plants, especially rhododendrons, which is something you see a lot in Cornwall and Devon, and the views were just absolutely amazing. It was a really good day, and any day that I get to learn something about an old building is definitely a good day for me. And yes, I do understand that that makes me sound like a grandma, but I'm kind of okay with that. On the way back to where we were staying, we ended up stopping at a bridge. 
And yes, that does sound really boring, but it was a really pretty bridge and I was able to get some really beautiful shots. So I was very happy with that. On the third day, we went to Trerice, which is an Elizabethan manor house. And it's also a National Trust property. This is probably one of the only places in Cornwall that I had already been to before that we then revisited. And it was incredibly beautiful. The outside and the gardens especially are just stunning. I will say if you're going to go to any of the houses that the National Trust own in Cornwall, I would say this one might not be the top of my list. I would recommend Lanhydrock or Coatheel, which we'll be going to later on in this video, but Trerice is really beautiful and the gardens are lovely, and luckily today was a nice-ish day, despite being kind of windy. We didn't spend a massive amount of time here, as the interior is definitely not as nice as some of the other National Trust properties, and we wanted to go and see Newquay as well, so that's where we headed to in the afternoon. By this time in the day, the wind had really started to pick up, it was blowing a gale, and yet the surfers were still out. Newquay is a massive hotspot for surfing in the UK, and rain or shine, you will find surfers out on the waves, and today was no different. When you actually went down onto the beach, however, it was a lot calmer and really warm, so I can completely understand why people were sunbathing and surfing, it's just when you're up on the cliffs, it's a lot of wind, and it's very, very noisy, so I'm very glad that I muted most of these clips. Somehow we managed to find ourselves in the most beautiful gardens that are right by the car park in Newquay. There was a really pretty rose garden and there was a lake with fountains and birds. And I will admit that the wind blew and we got sprayed straight in the face from this water fountain, which wasn't ideal. We ended up kind of soaked, but it was such a nice surprise to find something so green and so beautiful in a town that is just so, so busy. On day four, this is where the weather really went downhill. I'm not really sure what happened, but we ended up going to Tintagel on the wettest day of the week. And if anyone's been to Tintagel, you'll know that it's kind of exposed, there is no shelter, it's not the best place to visit during torrential rain. <laughs> and that is exactly when we decided to go, and we got absolutely drenched. But to start off with, it was pretty mild. We walked through the town, it was really beautiful. There's quite a few occult witchy shops there, but a lot of them were closed. It doesn't surprise me, we did go out of season and it was a very wet day. However, there was one shop that was open and that was called The Witch in the Wilderness. Now, I had no idea this shop was here and I'm so glad that I managed to go in. It is amazing inside. From what I can tell, it's a fairly new witchcraft shop, and it's more of a witchy decor, witchy homeware, and witchy clothing store than, say, a witchcraft supply shop, but it was still really, really lovely. I asked if I could get some video clips, and the lovely lady behind the counter said yes, so hopefully I will be putting them in here. And I got quite a few things while I was in here, and honestly, if you're in the area, it's well worth a visit. They have lots of different witchy t-shirts, they have oils, sprays, candles, mugs, soaps, which I ended up getting one of, and it smells amazing. And they also apparently do tarot readings, which could be good if anyone wants their cards read or wants some kind of advice on the things that they should carry out going forwards after a divination reading. So this was so cool, very glad I went in. We did go and get Cornish pasties. I didn't, however, get any video footage of it because I devoured it really, really quickly because I was so hungry. While we were in Tintagel, we also made a stop at the old post office, unsurprisingly, another National Trust property. It's a 14th century farmhouse and the National Trust's first property in Cornwall. It was acquired by them in 1903, and it's a building that has 600 plus years of history. It's a really interesting place with floors and staircases being added over time, wings being added and attached onto, it has a lot of 16th century furniture, including a table that was used for both preparing food, eating, and sleeping on, which is where the term bed and board comes from. This house also has a mezzanine-style sleeping platform. It's a sleeping area that would have only been accessible via ladder, and so unmarried women would sleep up on this mezzanine level so that they were safe and protected from the men around them. 
when each woman got married, she would no longer sleep up on this level, and so it's said that unmarried women were left on the shelf. It's a term that I've heard used so many times and I had no idea where it came from, and this house has a representation of it, which I think is super duper cool. It's very, 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 very wet. <laughs> we picked the worst day ever to come to Tintagel. Mm -hmm. Oops. <laughs> it's like torrential and it's gonna be this way all day. And then we decided to go to Tintagel Castle itself or at least the ruin of the original castle. Now for anyone who isn't already aware, Tintagel is the believed birthplace for King Arthur. Now we aren't really sure whether King Arthur was a real person or not, or whether he's simply a character that was created to add into different myths and legends. What we do know, however, is that the love of King Arthur is so strong that people will flock to Tintagel regardless of whether his story is true or not. It's probably one of the most popular sites owned by English heritage. In my opinion, it was worth it. I can't say that anyone else I went with agreed because it rained non-stop from the minute we got there to the minute we left, the kind of rain where no matter how many layers of waterproofs you have, you will end up soaked through by the end anyway. <laughs> and it was really interesting to learn about the exceptionally long history that this ruin actually has. For the most part, there's not that much to see. It's a 13th century ruin. It was once incredibly grand and it involved a medieval feasting hall where merriment and celebrations took place and there's remains of small buildings almost everywhere on the island. But the thing that most people go to see is the statue almost towards the end of the walk. And it's what you'll see most photos of and who it represents is really gonna be personal to everyone. But for me, I like to think that it's King Arthur. <sighs> Certainty, I can tell you that Tintagel is really isolated. It's very wet on a day like today, but it's also really cool, really beautiful. Seeing King Arthur's statue was just amazing, but my butt is wet, my feet are wet, everything is wet, even though I'm wearing waterproofs. So my hair is <laughs> like dripping with water. And I think it's time to go to a cafe because we've been standing up here for far too long because I have to read all of the signs. And now everyone is cold and miserable except me. So I think I'm gonna have to apologize by buying everyone like a really nice cup of tea or something similar so that they don't stay mad at me for keeping them on the top of a rock. Hmm, that's my plan. So we're gonna go down now. And my phone is like dangerously wet. So. <laughs> Right now. On the morning of the fifth day, we decided to go to the Vale of Avalon. Now this is a really interesting site we hadn't heard of previously, but it was actually featured on Channel 4's Jonathan Ross's Myths and Legends, which is a show all about, you guessed it, Myths and Legends, and it's episode 4 if anyone wants to check it out for themselves. Now this is a site that I thought would be really interesting. It is 16 acres, there is a small cafe, a shop, a little tiny museum, and then there is a walk that takes you down into the Vale itself. You can see the remains of a 13th century longhouse. You can see a muse garden, a newly planted orchard. You can also visit Lady Falmouth's secret garden, which is around 18th century, before walking through the Camlan battlefield and finally reaching the 6th century inscribed Oam stone. Now this was really what I was interested in, mostly because it's also considered one of the many possible sites for King Arthur's burial, which I thought was really, really cool. Now this Oam stone is really unusual. We believe it's sixth century because of the Oam carvings on one side of it, but on the other side, there's actually Latin carvings. And so it's really hard to figure out what this stone actually is, or what it was, and it's quite likely that it could have been an older stone that was then carved into at a later point. Now, sadly, through the centuries, a lot of the Oum is sadly missing, but we can still read just a small section of it on one side. It was a really interesting place. I don't think it would take up more than maybe half a day, but if you are in the area and you've got half a day to spend, it could be somewhere nice to visit just to see something a bit different. 
while we were here, we did find a clutie tree. Now, I believe that this is actually the Scottish name for them. I'm not sure of any other terms, so feel free to let me know in the comment section. These are usually small trees or patches of greenery where people will tie fabric and ribbons on them for blessings. Often this is done for Beltane or May Day celebrations. Now, I do want to add a disclaimer here that I wouldn't recommend doing this with any kind of synthetic fabric or on trees that are just out in nature and are potentially going to be harmed by the fabric being tied around them. But because this is a managed site and all of the fabric is removed on a regular basis to ensure the protection of the trees and the vegetation, I did feel fairly comfortable using the leftover fabric that was left out to make my own little wish on this tree. Now, I'm not going to tell you my wish, that's a secret, but I do really enjoy the fact that they added this small piece of history and magical practice into this site. In the afternoon, we ended up going to Port Isaac. Now, Port Isaac is most famous for being home of the TV show Doc Martin. Now, I will admit, I'm not a massive fan of the show, but a lot of people I know are, and I do know a little bit about it, so it was really interesting to see all of the locations where they filmed this really famous TV show. If you've not heard about the show, I'd recommend looking it up. It's not magical in nature, it's more of a doctor's show, but it is really interesting. When we were there, it suddenly went really warm, which is really different from this morning, where it was wet and rainy as it was at Tintagel. It's just our luck that when we're outside, it's going to be raining. But it was really nice to visit. We were really hungry by the time we got there, so we actually went into the Golden Lion, which is the pub that is seen within the show Doc Martin, and we had lunch there, which was really nice. We then went to get ice cream and fend off all of the seagulls, which if you've never been to England, is a really common thing that you have to experience at the seaside. We did go for a bit of a wander round. We walked all the way up the hill to Doc Martin's house to see the beautiful view before eventually walking down and heading back to the car park. But if you do go to Port Isaac yourself, I would recommend taking a walk along the coastal path because you get the most amazing views. On our final day, we went to Coat Heel House, another National Trust property and definitely one of my favourites. It's a Tudor building and it contains a lot of the original furniture, which is relatively unusual for National Trust properties. Usually the furniture is added in after the Trust owns the house, but in this case, it was already there. There's also a really large number of tapestries. They line almost every single wall and they give this large manor house an almost homely, comfortable feel. Sadly, however, those who actually put in the tapestries took them from a different location and cut them down to fit the space, which massively hurts my heart to know that there are bits and pieces of these tapestries that are lost forever. But either way, it was a stunning house. I would definitely visit here again. I would love to be able to do a painting of the outside of it. That would be amazing. There was so much that I enjoyed about this house. So many little pieces of information that I found truly interesting. And it's one of my favourite time periods for properties as well. The Tudor period is just so beautiful for architecture, at least in my opinion. This house is literally fit for a king or queen. There's a small tower at the top of the house which was designed for the king and queen of the time. However, it is said that when they arrived, they were already tired, lagging behind on their schedule, and they actually only spent about 45 minutes in the house before they left. So the king and queen actually never spent a night in the house, but I'm sure the owners like to boast that the king and queen had at least been inside, which is more than a lot of manor houses could say. The grounds were extensive. They went all the way from the manor house at the top of the hill down towards the estuary at the bottom of the hill, and I didn't actually get to see all of it. We didn't have enough time in the day, simply put, and so we had to pick and choose what areas we went to see. So we did miss out on a lot of the gardens, but what we did see was really beautiful, and it's one thing I will say about a lot of National Trust properties, is that usually it's going to take a full day for you to see it all thoroughly, at least if you read every single sign and look at every single item like I do. So I would recommend giving yourself enough time just to really take it in and also to be able to relax and sit and eat and not be on your feet walking around every minute while you're there. When our time in Cornwall came to an end, we really wanted to spend a little bit more time away from home. And so we spent one night in the Premier Inn in Glastonbury and spent two almost full days experiencing the magic and atmosphere of this amazing town. Now, many of you will have seen my previous Glastonbury vlogs, so I'm not going to go too far into my trip into Glastonbury, 
But the first day we were there was really hot. It was so lovely, 27 degrees, and we wanted to spend as much time outside as we could. So we walked our way all the way along through Glastonbury Town and out towards the Tor, where we spent some time in the White Spring, my favourite place in the entirety of Glastonbury, and also sitting in the gardens of the Chalice Well. Now the Chalice Well is a privately owned gardens and inside is the Chalice Well, a location that is really well known within the pagan community, especially in the British Isles. It sits very, very close to the Tor and it has such a magical feeling to it. It's a place of serenity where you're not allowed to have your phones on ring and you can really learn to sit, contemplate and even meditate within this magical garden. I didn't get many clips while I was there, mostly because I just wanted to experience the place. And with it finally being a hot day, we got to experience the great outdoors without getting wet in the process. I did get myself a small amount of the chalice well water, which I will be using within my spells and rituals, mostly for divination, but also for some protective and healing workings as well. Of course, I managed to find my way into the shops in town, which is no surprise to anyone, I'm sure. And I managed to get myself a few things while I was there, but mostly it was just nice to walk through the town. The oldest pub in town had a live music night, and with all of the windows open, the streets were just full of music, which is probably rather annoying for the residents who wanted to have a quiet night, but was really nice for everyone who was outside on the streets at that given time. Today is our final day on this entire trip and we are in Glastonbury for just a few more hours. We're leaving later this evening, so I'm currently packing up all of the hotel room, trying to get everything ready as fast as I can, but it's been just really nice to be here. As soon as we drive into Somerset, it just feels like home, and I think some of you will probably recognise that feeling. It maybe isn't somewhere that you live, but it's somewhere where as soon as you get there, you just feel so comfortable, so relaxed. That's what Glastonbury is like for me, and Somerset in general. So so it was so nice getting to see the tour again and driving through the town. Yesterday it was 27 degrees Celsius, which is really hot for us here. And I was hoping that the weather today would be the same. Yeah. It's not. I put this on thinking, oh yes, I get to wear my summer dress for the first time ever because it's never this warm in England. And then today, mm, grey. Grey. <laughs> It is grey and cloudy and raining and thunderstorms and I'm kind of regretting my choice but alas everything is packed up now I don't have the option of changing so we're gonna have to go with it and hope that it turns out fine <laughs> we will have to see it basically rained all day it was cold it was wet it was windy all day, but that did mean that we got to spend a lot of time in the shops. So we went into the Wonky Broomstick, a shop right at the far end of the high street. It's one of the highest shops that there actually is. There was also a shop I'd never been in before, and that was called the Coven Glastonbury. And oh my goodness, it was absolutely amazing inside. It's kind of like a marketplace where lots of small businesses can all sell their products in one location and there was so much in there that I fell in love with. I did come away with just a few things, but I tried not to go too bonkers in there because, wow, it was stunning inside. Everyone was super nice and it was really popular and I can completely understand why. As well as in Sons of Asgard, probably one of my favorite shops on the high street, full stop. Many of you will know that I get a lot of my items from there, especially a lot of my herbs and more unusual oils I will get from them. So if you're in the area, I would definitely recommend popping in. They have just so much amazing stuff. I did find my way into the White Rabbit, probably one of the largest shops on the high street, and I did end up getting a tarot deck in there, which is so beautiful. I will show you the deck on my haul video, which is coming up really soon, before I eventually and inevitably found myself in the bookshops. Labyrinth Books, The Speaking Tree, and especially Courtyard Books, where I was able to see some of the amazing books that are kept behind the counter. I was very grateful to be shown those because they are just amazing, completely unattainable, but absolutely amazing. And while I was there, I of course managed to pick up quite a few books. Very excited to share those with you and just to read them myself. 
So that was my trip all finished up and I could have spent so much time everywhere that we went. It was absolutely amazing. We fit so much into such a small amount of time, which unfortunately did mean that we probably didn't spend enough time in any given location, but there was just so much to see, especially if you are interested in magical history or just history in general. There is so much to see in Cornwall as well as in Glastonbury and Somerset. But unfortunately, our time there did have to come to an end, and I'm very glad that I got as much video footage and photos as I did. This video really is just a small fraction of everything that I took while I was there. If I'd have put it all in one video, it would have been several hours long. I would love to know where your favourite magical place is. Is it somewhere I visited? Is it somewhere local to you? Feel free to let me know. I would love to visit more magical places, so please give me some inspiration in the comment section. If you would like more videos like this, I've spent many a year vlogging my trips to Glastonbury, and a few weeks ago I posted a video all about the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. So if you enjoyed those sections in this video, they will be linked in the description box and also at the end of the video. If you did enjoy this video, please give it a like. It would really mean a lot to me. If you do have any questions, comments, concerns, video ideas, or just want to chit chat with the community, feel free to post it down in the comment section. And if you do enjoy the magical content on this channel or in this video, feel free to hit subscribe. I try to post magical content every single week. I've got more content like this coming up, including my witchcraft books that I purchased from Glastonbury. So if that's something that you are interested in, feel free to click the notification bell and hopefully, fingers crossed, YouTube might actually notify you. I'm not sure if it works, but it could be worth giving it a go. So with that being said, I hope you're all staying safe, I hope you have a marvellous magical day, and I will see you in the next video. Bye! And then I have to decide what I'm gonna do with all of these books. So that is for a second video. That can go there. This stuff has to go somewhere. Next to me. That will do. Ah, oh, that's suddenly considerably brighter than it was a minute ago. Disney, they tricked me. Whoa, it has a moon setting. Okay, that's cool. Let's do this. The light is on, that is on. I am not fudging it up this time. And yes, my thumbs do bend backwards. <laughs> what have I done? I've... Can't wait. Can you, you can see the books? Can I not? That's better. I'm like, why can you normally not see that much? I'm like, it's because I had my tripod in the wrong place. Ah, oh. I've literally been filming for 30 minutes, and all I'm doing is an intro and an outro. <laughs> I struggle so much with this, like, it's staring at this little letter on my camera, like, with the bright light here, and the bright light here, and it's like, my eyes! <laughs> it's very bright. Okay. <sighs> Last try. Oh. I don't know what I'm trying to say, is basically what I'm getting at here. <laughs> Ooh, I have just spent 40 minutes filming an intro and an outro. <laughs> It's wet, wet. I'm gonna go have a drink and then hopefully film a Patreon video. Fingers crossed. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this video. Bye! Mm -hmm.